You can start when you're ready. Thanks, Natasha. Um, are you able to see my screen um, right now, or is it paused? See your notes, too. Oh, you can see the notes, too. Mm, OK, sorry. Let me just see if I can. Let me try this one more time. That looks better. That looks better? Okay. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks for inviting me. Um, my name is Sarah, and I'm the Student Liaison Officer in the Department of Physical Therapy here at the U of T. Um, I'm here today to tell you a little bit about um, our Master of Science in Physical Therapy program. Um, and what it's all about and what you would need to do if you were interested in applying to this. Um, so let me just flip over here and we'll get started. Um, so I just wanted to start off with a little bit of an overview about what physical therapy is um, and a little bit about the profession. Then I'll tell you a bit about the, uh, the actual MSCPT program and we'll talk about the admission requirements. And I will give you some contact information um, that you can reach out to us if you have questions later on. So a lot of people wonder, what is physical therapy exactly? And I know for a lot of people, um, the first thing that comes to mind would be like your musculoskeletal physio. So somebody that you would go and see if you, for example, had like um, a sports injury and you hurt your knee or something like that. And you would go and see a physio and the physio would work with you. Um, to try and get your mobility back and your functioning back so that you could get back into whatever sport um, you were interested in. So that's the first thing that comes to mind for many people. And before I started working in PT, that's exactly what came to mind for me as well. Um, but PTs actually work um, in areas much, much broader than just musculoskeletal. Um, they actually work throughout the entire body system. So um, they work with the cardiorespiratory system, the neurological system, so like your nervous system, um, and everything in between. So PTs are really focused on movement. Um, they are not going to be doing the mental health stuff that you heard about with um, occupational therapy. We focus in this department specifically on mobility, movement, and functioning. Okay, so it's very physical, hence physical therapy. Um, so PTs, um, they really try to prevent and diagnose and then treat um, dysfunctional movement through exercise and education. Um, physical therapy is a pretty dynamic career. Um, the patients that you have are never the same. You're always going to be problem solving as you journey through um, your career. And you have to learn how to adapt different treatment plans and exercise protocols for different situations. Um, and the other thing too, is that you really do start to create, um, bonds with your patients and their families as you navigate through, um, the rehabilitation journey together. So it is quite a broad, um, interesting and dynamic career choice. Um, so physical therapists will treat people of all ages, right from little tiny infants, all the way up to your geriatric populations. Um, as I mentioned before, they do work with all body systems. So nervous, cardiorespiratory, MSK, and everything in between. Um, you can find physiotherapists working um, in places like hospitals, healthcare uh, clinics. They work in private practice. Um, some of them work in research and education. You see them in administrative roles, and you even see them running their own businesses. Um, so for example, you might find a physiotherapist uh, working in an emergency room or an ICU in a hospital. Um, you might find them working in a long-term care home or in a business or a clinic. Um, and then you might also find, uh, find them in, you know, in a professional sports team setting where they're on the sidelines or maybe in the locker rooms helping take care of the athletes. Um, so there's lots of different areas you can specialize in once you sort of get into the field. Um, and I should mention too, the, uh, the job prospects are uh, very good right now, excellent, I should say, uh, in physiotherapy. 
Okay. Um, so there's a group called the National Physiotherapy Advisory Group, um, and they have established what they call um, physiotherapy competency profiles, which is really just a fancy way of saying that this is the essential knowledge, skills, and competencies um, and attitudes that are required by um, physiotherapists when they enter the profession, um, and also as they work throughout their career in Canada. So I just wanted to touch on a few of these competencies briefly here um, to sort of give you a better sense of what physiotherapists um, focus on throughout their career. Uh, so first, we'll talk about the expert role. So physiotherapists are experts in function and mobility. Um, they integrate all of the different physiotherapist roles to lead, um, you know, to lead in promotion and improvement and maintenance of mobility, health, and well-being of Canadians. Um, they also have to ensure that they're using effective communication uh, to develop their professional relationships with clients and families um, and other stakeholders. Um, PTs also work collaboratively. Um, so I think the interprofessional health teams were mentioned um, earlier. So PTs are a part of that team. Um, so they do need to be able to work collaboratively and effectively um, to promote this interprofessional practice and optimal client care. Uh, physiotherapists also manage time, uh, resources, and priorities at all levels for individual practice, and also to ensure sustainable um, physiotherapy practice overall. Um, and this will probably appeal to um, a small group of you as well. PTs are advocates, um, so they're responsible for using their knowledge and expertise to promote um, the health and the well-being of their clients, their communities, um, their populations, and the profession as a whole. And so PTs are also committed to ongoing learning. So once you get your degree, the learning doesn't stop. Um, oftentimes we have um, students who finish their initial therapy, um, uh, finish their initial uh, Master of Science in Physical Therapy program, and then they go on to specialize in other areas. So some of them go on to become specialists in pediatrics, or they become specialists in, um, you know, uh, concussion treatments, or maybe they become specialists in working with a particular clientele. Um, so there's lots of different options for specializing once you have finished your basic training. Um, and then the last piece I'm going to touch on here is professionalism. Um, so physiotherapists um, do need to be committed to the best interests of their clients and societies um, through ethical practice. Um, supporting profession-led regulation and ensuring that they maintain high personal standards of behavior. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we when we mention the essential competencies. I mean, there's a few others here, but I'll um, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, I've mentioned a little bit already here about the different types of careers that physiotherapists find themselves in, um, so I won't spend too much longer on that. Um, I think what I'm going to do now is switch over into um, talking a little bit about the actual program. So the Master of Science in Physical Therapy program offered at the U of T is a 24 month professional program leading to entry to practice. Um, so what that means is um, upon completing the Master of Science in PT, you will be eligible to write the Canadian Physiotherapy Association and Colleges of Physiotherapy um, licensing exam. So you can write the exam and then you can practice anywhere in the country. Um, so having said that, we do have, um, as I said, this is a 24 month professional program. It lasts for two years. Um, and there's a few things that are unique about um, the program. So we have recently um, renewed the curriculum, and I'll talk a little bit about that in some more details. Um, we have quite a renowned um, group of faculty members that work within and uh, teach in the program as well. And um, of course, at U of T, you'll have access to uh, all of the different um, resources that the campus offers. Okay, uh, so the MSCPT is offered um, only on a full-time basis um, beginning in September. We don't have a part-time option um, and we do not have a January start date. It's just full-time September. 
Um, the program will prepare you to practice, as I said, in any area of physical therapy with patients of any age. Um, it is a full two years, um, and you will have a mix of uh, academic theory, research, um, hands-on practice, as well as clinical internships where you're working with actual patients um, in order to develop the skills and knowledge you need to become um, an entry-level practicing physiotherapist. So I did mention earlier that we had recently um, renewed the curriculum. So this was done in 2019 um, after a number of years of um, extensive evaluation. Um, so the core mission of the program is to develop highly skilled, competent physical therapists. Um, and to accomplish this, um, there are three pillars within this renewed curriculum. Um, the first one is critical thinking. Um, the second one is inquiry mindset, and then there's professionalism. Um, so these pillars um, move from vision to action through a series of targeted changes um, that shape both the classroom and the clinical learning, um, and they're weaved throughout the two years of the program. Um, and we also have a number of cross-curricular components that are also um, weaved throughout the program. Um, you can see some of them listed out here. So there's context and practice, um, you know, electrical physical agents, exercise science, pain science, um, IPE or interprofessional education, um, and then what we call SPEC, um, which is the social, political, ethical, and cultural dimensions of healthcare. So these are all integrated um, throughout the program right from the very beginning. We don't have separate courses on these things. Um, these are things that are talked about within each of the courses of the program. So this is an example of what the curriculum looks like over the course of the two years. Um, you will essentially start off the program with um, some basic sort of foundational um, learning knowledge and skills. Um, and then, so that would be the first three to four units. Um, unit five, which takes place in the early summer of your first year is your first clinical internship. Uh, and this is where you would be working under the supervision of a physiotherapist working with actual clients. Um, then you come back, you reflect on what you've learned in the clinic, and uh, you learn a little bit more, and then you go back out again for another internship. Uh, so year two is very similar in terms of the setup. You would learn a little bit in the classroom, in the labs, then you get to go out and actually practice it in the clinical setting, and then you come back, regroup, refocus, um, and then you go back out again. So that sort of gives you a sense of what the program looks like. You'll see there's a few little spots here for vacation as well um, in between the, the two years, but it does run essentially full time for two years. Another interesting fact um, about the program is that we have the uh, highest publication rate of student research papers. Um, so one of the courses that you will complete in year two is research course. Um, and within that course, you will be developing um, a research project and carrying that out. Um, and then you have the option of publishing the paper afterwards. Um, so I've given you a couple examples here of some of the uh, recent projects that have been published um, from students in our program. Um, and I wanted to take a minute to talk to you about um, our clinical education in a little bit more detail. Um, so we do have a number of different types of um, settings that we place students. Um, so you can see the different categories there. So there's pediatrics, there's um, like long-term care, um, administration, research, um, private practice, and so forth. Um, so by the time you finish the program, you will have gained experience in each of these different areas. So you don't need to worry about going out into practice and going, oh, no, I've never worked with kids or, oh, no, I've never worked with the elderly population or, oh, no, I've never worked with whatever. You will have experience with all of these different areas. OK, um, and we also have the opportunity for students to select um, an area that they're interested in towards the end of the year. Um, and if it's possible, um, we do try to put the students in their preferred learning setting for their final placement. Um, in terms of clinical sites, 
Uh, we have quite an extensive network of clinical teaching sites that are available to the students. Um, there's actually over 200. I've listed a couple examples here on the slides, um, but there's many, many, many more. Um, and you can actually see a whole list of them on our website. Um, I'll give you the website at the end of the session and you can have a look through that. Um, our general area is similar to, um, it's basically the GTA. So um, I, we have a map on the website as well that essentially goes out to sort of, um, I think it's Oshawa in one end, um, Brampton the other end, uh, and then I think I wanna say Vaughan in the north, um, but you can check the exact dimensions. Um, we have a map on the website, shows you exactly where the different sites are. Um, we do our very best to try and place you somewhere that is um, you know, feasible for traveling um, back and forth, depending on where you're living. So we do our best to do that. Um, but there are quite a number of different places that, uh, that you can potentially be practicing in. Okay. Um, so I'll mention too, uh, we do have quite a number of facilities and activities available to you um, at the St. George campus, which is where this program takes place. Um, so this is a, just a quick picture of a couple of the activities our students have been in recently. They're quite an active group of, of, um, of students. PT students love intramurals. They are, and they win them all the time. We have so many banners up in, the, in, the, in our building for the intramurals. Um, they also have a whole bunch of different student clubs that they run. Um, so some examples of some of the things our PT students have been involved with recently has been, um, so student council puts together orientation events for all of our incoming students. And they have, they actually call it O-Month. It's an entire month long orientation thing where there's a whole bunch of different activities that they all do together for September. Um, there's an annual Smartest PT contest uh, that also involves our faculty. They're all part of that as well. Um, I mentioned intramurals already, and um, they do like a PROM, which is kind of like their physical therapy prom type of thing. Um, there's a whole bunch of different things. They're very active. They're very um, involved. And then, of course, you've got access to the broader U of T things as well, um, cultural events and programming, um, student clubs and so forth. Okay. So I'm going to move along and talk to you a little bit about um, the admission requirements for the program um, and what you would need to do in order to be competitive. So you'll notice that a lot of these admission requirements are similar to what you're going to see for um, occupational science and occupational therapy and also similar to speech language pathology. Um, so I'm going to run through this a little bit here with you, just like the other two programs, um, you are going to need to have um, a bachelor's degree with a minimum of a mid B in the final year of study. Um, most of the arts and science degrees um, that we have at U of T are fine, um, and they're considered appropriate. So some examples would be things like a Bachelor of Science, a Bachelor of Arts, um, if you're studying kinesiology, that's good. Um, there are, uh, similar to what uh, Liam was saying, there are some exceptions, um, and this tends to be primarily in performance or studio-based programs. Um, so things like music, drama, fine arts, and dance um, are often uh, ineligible because they don't have um, enough liberal arts and science content within the degree. If you're not sure about your program, um, feel free to reach out to the department. Um, but in general, most programs are fine, and most of our applicants um, come from a background in science, kinesiology, or a Bachelor of Arts. So we are um, going to have both an academic and a non-academic assessment. So starting off with the academic component, this is what you would need for um, degree in terms of your degree and your coursework. Um, I've mentioned the cutoff here already. Um, it is a mid B in the last year, but to, to really be competitive in this, in this application process, um, you will need probably between an A minus and an A uh, in the last two years of your study. Okay, um, the mid B is, a, is the absolute minimum that our School of Graduate Studies um, requires, but to be competitive, you are going to need um, probably A minus to A in the last two years. We do look at um, the last 20 half credits or 10 um, full course equivalents, um, which is approximately the last two years of study if you've done a four year degree and you've studied full time. 
Um, so the cutoff does tend to vary from one year to the next in terms of the minimum GPA. Um, so it's been as high as 3.83, and it's been as low as like 3.78 in recent history. Um, the exact cutoff is going to depend on how many applications we receive. So last year it was 3.83, but we also had almost 1,300 applications for the program. So that was the primary reason for the, the cutoff being um, so much higher. In addition to having your undergraduate degree, um, we do have some prerequisite coursework that applicants need to complete before they apply to the program. We do ask for specifically a background in human physiology, uh, human anatomy, uh, statistics or research methods, um, life science or physical science, and then a, a combination of social science, humanities, and language. Um, and this is to ensure that you have the background knowledge needed to, um, you know, to, to be able to start the program and be confident in those first initial foundational courses. Um, we ask that the prerequisites are completed recently. So if you've been out of school for a while, this is something you might want to double check before you submit your application. Um, the prerequisites shouldn't be more than seven years old. And we do ask that you have a minimum of a B minus or 70% uh, in each of the prerequisite courses. I mentioned before that we, uh, we look at the last two years of um, your, your academic work um, and we calculate what's called a sub GPA. Um, you can learn a little bit more about how sub GPA is calculated on that ORPASS website that Aline was mentioning. Um, I'll give you, I can put the link in the chat box for you. Um, they give you some really good detailed breakdowns of exactly how it's calculated, but it's basically um, your last two years of study, okay? Um, and there's an example here of your, uh, what's something called the conversion table that they use to uh, calculate your sub-GPA when you apply to these programs. Um, so this is not the current one. This was one from a couple of years ago, but just to give you a sense of how the uh, sub-GPA is calculated depending on the school you're from, okay? So they kind of take it, uh, they try and put everything onto a level playing field so that you're not disadvantaged based on, you know, whether your school has a letter grading system or whether your school has a numerical percentage-based system. Okay, uh, we do have some non-academic requirements um, as well as part of the application process. Um, we ask everybody to complete something called the CASPER test. Um, and the CASPER test is an online situational judgment test that's completed on a computer. Um, it it's intended to measure personal and professional characteristics that we think are important um, to the profession. So things like communication and empathy um, and ethics. The test, as I said, it's completed online. Um, you will need a webcam to do it. Um, and the way it works is you will watch a video scenario and it's typically some kind of an ethical conundrum. Uh, and then you're gonna be asked to respond um, to questions about that situation. So what would you do in this situation? Or if you were this person, um, what do you think would be the best next move? Um, so we do recommend that you complete the practice test that um, is published on the Casper website. I can put that uh, website in the chat box for you too. Um, I know there are companies that offer like, kind of like MCAT prep, but they do like Casper test prep. Um, as of right now, there's no research to support um, that you can practice really for this type of test or prepare. It's not like an MCAT that you can study for. Um, it, the, the real reason for doing the practice test is so you get familiar with the, the format of the test um, because it is quite fast. It's quite, the, you don't get a lot of time to, to do your answers. Um, and most of the people I've talked to who have done this test have said that's the hardest part. It's not the actual content of the test. It's just the format is so quick. Um, so that's the reason why we recommend um, that you don't spend money on prep courses for this particular one. Um, just go on their website and do the practice test. That'll be the best prep for you. Um, okay. The next thing we're going to ask for are two academic, or sorry, two reference letters, one academic and one professional. 
So your academic reference letter would be so somebody who's taught you a course in university. Um, and then your non non academic or your professional one would be like an employer if you've had a part time job um, or a supervisor if you've done some clinical or some volunteer experience somewhere, that sort of thing. Just make sure that there's um, that whoever you're asking is somebody who can really comment on um, your ability to succeed uh, in a healthcare profession and your academic ability. So make sure it's someone that actually knows you and not just somebody that you've reached out to because you did okay in the course, but there's like a thousand people in the course and they really don't know you. Um, those types of letters are pretty obvious to us when we read them. So um, do try to pick somebody who's you know familiar with you. Um, the final non-academic component to the admission process is called the CAP um, or Computer Administered Profile. This is a U of T specific thing. Um, so the CAP is sort of like an interview. It's a, it, you complete it online. Um, it's a series of questions and it is like sort of a timed thing. Um, and you'll be asked to talk a little bit about what brought you to where you are today, why you're pursuing physical therapy, um, we might give you some scenario based questions um, where we, we say, you know, what would you do in a situation like this or how would you approach a situation like that. Um, and the cap is really your opportunity to tell us who you are um, and why you would be a fantastic fit for both the MSC PT program and the profession um, as a whole. Uh, so remember that, you know, as part of this application, we don't ask you for any sort of um, volunteer hours, we don't ask you for a resume, there's nowhere on the volunteer or on the uh, application for you to tell us about you, and what makes you different from everybody else who's applying to the program. Um, all that we see from the application is, you know, your transcript and your grades and your test scores and that sort of thing. So the CAP is your opportunity to tell us about you um, and who you are and why you're going in this direction. Um, so this is where you can kind of refer to um, your job experience or if you've had volunteer experience. Um, whatever sort of lived experience you have, this is where you would bring it up, is on the CAP test. Um, so the CAP test is by invitation only. We typically invite between 300 and 350 applicants to come in and write this. Um, I shouldn't say come in, it used to be in person. Um, it's online now. So we invite up to 350 people to write it online. Um, and then I'll show you sort of the overall how we put the rankings together. We will start off with the CASPER score. We take basically the top 80% of people who have scored on CASPER. So it's only the very, very bottom group that doesn't move forward. Um, we do have some more information on the website um, with some specifics on how CASPER is used, but I'll let you look at that um, yourself. So top 80% of CASPER scores move forward. Then we go through, we look at your GPA, we look at your reference letters, we look to make sure you've completed all of the prerequisites. Top 350-ish are invited to write the CAP. Uh, the CAP is completed online. Once those CAPs are scored, uh, we come up with a ranking for you, which is 60% based on GPA and the other 40% based on the CAP. Uh, so that's how we come up with our overall ranking. Um, I have some statistics posted here. You can have a look at these on our website too, just to show you sort of how many um, people we get applying to the program in, in a typical year. Um, submitting an application, this is the OUAC website I mentioned before, ORPAS. You use the same website for um, speech language pathology, occupational science and therapy, and for PT. Um, the, dan the, the deadline here is the same one. It's January 7th for all three of the programs. Um, so I will put this into the chat box as well with a reminder to please make sure you send everything directly to ORPAS and not to the individual universities. Um, this is the web website here for Casper. Okay, I'll put that into the chat box for you as well. And this is our contact information. So if you have questions you think about later on, um, or you look at something on the website and you're not sure, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to, um, to give you a hand with uh, any of that. And I think I'm gonna leave it there. If there's any questions, I'm happy to address those. Otherwise, um, you can also put them in the chat box and I'll do my best to try and answer those. Thanks very much.
yeah, we can take a few questions until noon. If anyone has questions, you can post it in the Q&A or chat for Sarah. If there is no other questions, then you can email Sarah on your own time. Um, do you have anything else to add, Sarah? Okay, I'm gonna stop recording.